Welcome everyone uh, to Protecting Waters of the Earth. Uh, my name is Jason Donofrio. I'm with the Ocean Foundation and I'm delighted to have you all with us here tonight. Uh, we know that you could be spending your night doing anything, but we're really grateful that you're here with us here tonight to talk about some critical issues affecting our planet and affecting our Earth uh, everywhere around the globe. Many manufacturing and agricultural practices, especially when it comes to animal confinement, degradation of our water quality, uh, post-colonialism affecting island and coastal communities that have dispute over withdrawal of water from areas like the Blue Nile, have all had an impact on what is happening to local communities today and our society globally. Hydropower from dams and intensifies climate change while undermining habitat. And all of this degradation has led to the leading of the poisoning of both animal and human life. Uh, tonight, you'll also hear about some of the issues related to overfishing by some of the wealthier nations exploiting the resources of poorer nations, increasing impoverishment while stealing uh, food and resources from those most in need. You'll also hear from some of the people on the forefront of these issues talking about what is happening with deep sea mining and what campaigns are being leveled to protect communities and their ocean resources. One note that I wanna mention before we get started is on what is happening with our ocean around the world. The ocean is directly responsible for every other breath of life we take on earth yet it is constantly being exploited and underinvested. Ocean acidification, the acidification of our ocean waters as one example, uh, is an effect of climate change as CO2 dissipates into our ocean waters. Today, the ocean is 30% more acidic than it was just 200 years ago. So think about that, 200 years is pretty brief on the human record and the ocean is 30% more acidic than it was just 200 years ago. And it's acidifying faster than at any point in human history. The only way to address ocean acidification, pollution of our waters, the effects of climate change are to address these at their root causes. And so you have some esteemed uh, colleagues uh, here today to talk about that. Someone put in there, what causes ocean acidification just Quickly, when CO2 is absorbed by seawater, a series of chemical reactions occur, resulting in the increased concentration of hydrogen ions. This increase causes the seawater to become more acidic and causes carbonate ions to be relatively less abundant. This affects shellfish industry, it affects coral reefs, it affects all marine life. So we're gonna dive into these issues now here today. While I paint uh, a dire situation, let me assure you, there are also solutions on the forefront. And that is what you are gonna hear today. Not just the threats, but the solutions that are being done to address them. Our first speaker tonight is Kathleen Logan Smith, who began fighting for communities in Oklahoma impacted by toxic waste disposal facilities. She has stood firm with communities opposing toxic and medical waste incinerators, factory farms, and polluters. She works to preserve water and sovereignty and strengthen environmental standards with a focus on organic agriculture and food sovereignty. Kathleen, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you now. Thank you. And I'm happy to be filling in on this talk. And I really wish I could tell you that Things have changed from when I started 35 years ago, but they haven't. Um, but we are talking, we're looking at agriculture. And so I wanna highlight agriculture today because a lot of people think about pollution and they think of something coming out of the end of a pipe, some factory or something being dumped in the water directly. And a big chunk of our pollution problem comes directly from agriculture, from uh, farmlands and into our rivers and waters. And that is kind of the big elephant in the room because we have a thing called the Clean Water Act that we wrote after the rivers in Ohio caught fire back in the day. And the Clean Water Act is okay. It's a useful tool. 
it doesn't touch agriculture. Um, and that is one of the problems with it. It doesn't get close enough to the problem to solve it. Um, anyway, so in Missouri, our big problems are nitrogen fertilizer and the use of nitrogen fertilizer across the whole country is up and it's been up and it's been on a curve like that for a hundred years. And ever since the end of World War II, we have had a huge spike in that. And that goes directly into our waters and directly into our groundwater and into the Gulf of Mexico and becomes the hypoxic zone at an annual event that kills fish and drives fish out of the water. So that, that being said, we also have pesticides that are used. Um, and just corn and soy alone, which are our primary uh, GMO crops, and each one is over like 90 million acres in the US, um, tons of herbicides, 95% of our crops are herbicides are used on. They're not organic. Um, and there is an increase in organic production in this country in organic crops. And that's probably the only good news um, that I have for you. Luckily, Barb has more good news, but um, it's still less than 1% of our crop land. So if a good 95% of our land is being, um, you know, herbicides and pesticides are being applied, uh, they're going somewhere. And when researchers dig around, they find them in the food. Uh, they find them in the urine of our children. They find them um, in, um, you know, insect colonies and waters and rainwater. And these chemicals are kind of everywhere. And they cause all kinds of health problems. And if you look in your own family, you probably know somebody who's got some weird inexplicable autoimmune disease or somebody who has some, you know, strange food allergy that you've never heard of before, or, um, I mean, I can't, I, I don't, it's sad to see parents struggle with how to feed their children when our food system is so toxic and our world is so toxic and it's not safe. Um, and it's been sad, sad to watch. Um, the, um, in case you think that somehow you're escaping this because you eat organic food. Um, you're not, <laughs> but you are making a difference because every time you buy an organic anything, you've created some demand for an organic farmer and an organ organic farmer is not gonna be using um, herbicides and pesticides. And they're going to be feeding soil life and pollinators and making sure wildlife matters and um, wild creatures have a place in their system. And that, is going to make a difference in the long term. Right now, all the incentives are still stacked in favor of the chemical companies and the farming systems are still stacked in terms of the chemical companies. And even with all this talk about cover crops and, and protecting the soil with cover crops, we also noticed that um, Bayer, Monsanto, DuPont are using it as an opportunity to sell more herbicides to kill that cover crop every spring when they wanna plant uh, corn and soybeans. And so, all of that feeds a system and the simple solution is to buy organic, eat organic and grow organic. But the bigger challenge is to get Congress um, off of chemicals and off of its drug habit. And I'm gonna turn this over to Barb Ticario to talk about what's happening with CAFOs because they're, it's also related. You need to understand that um, the crops we grow in, in, the, in, in the America are grown for CAFOs. So the corn and soybean are grown to feed the pigs and chickens and cattle that are in concentrated animal feeding operations. And so it's all one of the same problem. And um, states like Illinois and Iowa, which are the biggest producers and Missouri's third on that list of corn and soybeans have millions and millions of acres uh, growing corn and soybeans, but they can't feed themselves. Missouri can't feed itself locally. Illinois can't feed itself and neither can Iowa. So they're importing food people eat from California and China and Mexico and Chile and all over the world because they can't feed themselves because they've abandoned that model of agriculture and they just grow commodities for Wall Street and they use chemicals to make that happen and they don't care about the consequences and they are paying consequences. Farmer's health is notoriously impacted by, by chemicals. Uh, we've had in Missouri, we've had whole lakes that have been damaged by herbicides. We've had um, nutrient pollution in our in our recreational waters um, and in most of our surface waters in the state. 
And that's a good uh, segue to Barb. So Barbara, tell us how we got all the surface waters polluted in Missouri. Well, um, Kat's absolutely right about the monocultures that are grown in Iowa and, and uh, Missouri. 85% of what's fed to animals in CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations, are GMO crops, corn and soybeans. Um, and so it is a circle. And then of course the manure, which is overproduction of the manure is thrown back onto the, the land and the manure is not clean. It's got a lot of um, pesticides and antibiotics in it. So can't, uh, the sheer amount of animal waste that comes from concentrated animal feeding operation is endangering, also endangering Missouri's rivers and streams as well as the Mississippi River. And as Cap pointed out, this is also contributing to the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So our waters are all connected. Um, here are a few little facts about the waters of Missouri, and this is not very good news. The Missouri River is the seventh most polluted waterway in the United States, large part and largely due to animal agriculture, manure waste from CAFOs. Missouri has more than 350 impaired lakes and streams with nutrient waste being the significant factor. And presently there are over 500 permitted CAFOs that hold thousands of hogs. Mostly in Missouri it's hogs and chickens, but I've really been looking mostly at hogs. Um, and we have no idea about facilities holding less than 1,000 hogs because they're not even required to get a permit. And nobody knows about them until there's a spill and a citizen uh, lets the Department of Natural Resources know. Water quality impacts include algae blooms, fish kills, contamination of drinking water, and the limit of recreational use. And recreation um, is significant in our beautiful state because of our springs and aquifers that draw a lot of um, uh, tourism. And um, it's gonna, th this problem is really impacting our tourism. Um, we have suffered some significant setbacks in, challenge, in challenging the proliferation of CAFOs. Uh, one was um, something called the right to farm, which was a piece of Koch brothers model legislation that narrowly passed in 2014 as a constitutional amendment. And that really opened the door for more foreign investment in our state, giving big ag the green light. And one example of that is Smithfield, which was an old American company, but it was bought by a Chinese consortium. And they operate multiple large-scale large hog CAFOs in Missouri. Another setback was our Clean Water Commission. And uh, in Missouri, the Clean Water Commission is tasked by the EPA to monitor our Missouri waters. Before 2016, that commission required that four out of the seven seats, I've got one minute left, <laughs> my timekeeper's telling me, were held by members of the general public. And due to a law change, now the commission is stacked with representatives of big business and big ag. Uh, there is a little bit of, there's a light, a little bit of light under this gloomy door. In the last year, an application for a CAFO permit was withdrawn due to public outcry, and that CAFO was to be cited adjacent to a state converse, uh, um, conservation area. And there was a lot of, of, of uh, a lot of re public response to that, and they backed down. And Smithfield withdrew 10 applications to make currently permits, held permits more lenient. And so I think the biggest tool we've got, and we're seeing more and more of that, is uh, voices of citizens. And our task, okay, I'm almost done. I'm gonna finish. Thank you. <laughs> and our task is to inform um, citizens and uh, let their voices be heard. So in Missouri, our conflicts over water take the form of the needs of industrial agriculture against citizens' needs for clean water and the need to protect our ecosystems and all that dwell within. This is our struggle. There are struggles over water being waged across the world. Um, and it's certain that these struggles are going to intensify. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh -huh. Great. Thank you so much, Barbara and Kathleen um, for that great presentation. Uh, we really appreciate it. 
Okay, so um, as many of you have been utilizing the Q&A function, please continue to do that. And to our speakers, um, we can answer those questions directly. Um, we'll also have some time at the end to do that as well, but we'll try and address them throughout. Uh, now we are, are gonna uh, shift gears um, right now, and we're going to go to Louise Kinsasha. Uh, Louise is the Secretary General of the African Socialist International. He's also a broadcaster for Africa Must Unite. He is a writer as well as an editor of the bilingual edition, both in French and English, of Burning Spear. Uh, I am going to share his presentation on my screen right now. Hopefully all of you can see that. And Louise, I will turn it over to you to begin your presentation. Ooh, thank you, uh, Jason, uh, for the introduction. I want to thank uh, Gateway Green Alliance for inviting me. And I want to salute all the uh, co-panelists today. And I want to salute my comrades in St. Louis, and particularly my chairman of Marie Stella, uh, who is the uh, leader of the uh, African Socialist International. My name is Luis Kinshasa. I'm the Secretary General of the uh, ASI, as I said, uh, created by Chairman of Marie Stella, to complete the Black Revolution of the 60s, to overturn the verdict of imperialist white power over Africa. Now, uh, what you have in front of you is the first slide. 76% of African people have no access to clean water. And uh, this is a major problem. The major problem is the control of water by colonial states and corporations. That's why 76% of African people have no access to clean water. The conflict of water in Africa is essentially a conflict between the African nation and the colonizers because the colonizers control the whole economy of Africa, including water and oil resources. Uh, next, please. All African problems are colonial problems. Lack of clean water is one of the colonial problems. Of course, when you see the news, uh, you read the newspapers, you're familiar with all the images uh, you see uh, the wars, famine, corruption, land borders, dispute, malaria, Ebola, coup, privatization of water and energy, France, Africa, uh, Commonwealth, water pollution, landslide, mother and the child mortalities, colonial violence and rapes, child soldiers, stolen African uh, art. And uh, all these are manifestation of colonial domination of the uh, African, African people across the planet. Next, please. All genuine solutions must be anti-colonial solutions. Colonialism has to be eradicated from the planet. There is no way you can solve water conflict in Africa if colonialism is not eradicated, because what we see in Africa today is not free Africa, it's neo-colonialism. As we say in our movements, it's a basically a white power in a black face. That's what you see throughout Africa and throughout the black community on the planet. Next, please. Climate change, floods, drought, water stress, and seasonal variability are not the primary causes of water scarcity. They are consequences of colonial domination of Africa because usually people <clears throat> confuse consequences and the primary causes. So we want to make it clear the primary causes of all these problems associated with water, climate change, everything Africa experiencing is definitely uh, conditioned by the domination of Africa by colonialism. Next, please. Water grab is part of a land grab in Africa by old and new colonizers. You can't talk of water scarcity or water problem without talking of a land grab in Africa. They're all part of colonial domination of Africa. Just for as an example, 60 million hectares stolen just by 2012. And now we are 2022, an area of the size of France. These are the old and new colonizers, you know, grabbing land uh, through neocolonialism uh, in Africa. Next, 
Clean water for all, no more water for profit. From South Africa to North Africa, and you also go, you go through the Caribbean, you will see the same thing, Haiti and Jamaica and the South. Uh, you will see companies, you know, colonial companies or corporations control water. So, uh, which is a, a water subsidiary of Bouygues, which is a building company from France. You go Suez Lyonnais. Uh, on the U, subsidiary of WSSA, you got Vivendi, Irish Utilities, Viola. There are many companies. I just put some of them companies. They control water. They determine if African people will have access to water or not. Next. Now, water conflict between Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan. This is known because it's been publicized. Uh, and uh, we want to say clearly from start, this uh, conflict between these three countries requires an all African solution. There is no Egyptian solution or Ethiopian solution or Sudanese solution. It requires an all African solution. Next. The Nile River unifies Africa because when you look at the map, it starts uh, in between Rwanda, Burundi and the Congo on, on one hand and Lake Victoria in Uganda also provide water to the Nile and we have the uh, the Blue Nile which comes from uh, Ethiopia and you can see go to Sudan to Egypt so many countries you know are part of this Nile uh, basin 11 countries are, are part of it but colonialism divides Africa the borders divide Africa prevent those countries from having a unified solution Next, please. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, Grand um, uh, Hydroelectric Dam that's being uh, built is supposed to provide electricity to 50%, you know, with 2,000 megawatts uh, to Ethiopian po population. And uh, this does not even take into consideration uh, the solar uh, geothermal and the wind, the biomass. Africa has multiple sources of uh, untapped uh, of uh, energy. So a uh, electric uh, using the Nile River doesn't have to be uh, because as I said, it requires a unified approach, unified solution. Uh, next, please. I can't see the rest of it. Not everything is showing up. Yeah, if you can bring it down a bit. No. Uh, you can't okay so basically uh which is here we're talking of uh, a 1929 agreement you can't see it i can't see the whole of it but it's a 1929 ag uh, agreement uh between uh egypt and britain and you all know by 1929 most of the african countries were colonized so this is the is a illegal you will say illegitimate agreement it was a uh, britain who claimed to represent uh, most of the African countries when they signed this agreement uh, with uh, with Egypt? So most African countries were excluded uh, uh, from it. So the colonial agreements signed between Egypt and Great Britain gave Cairo, Egypt, basically the right to veto project higher up the Nile that will affect its water share. And uh, which is uh, interesting is that Egypt. You know, talking about the uh, the dam being built by uh, by uh, Ethiopia, Egypt uh, will not sign a peace, uh, uh, will not sign a water treaty with Ethiopia uh, to use the water together, but they can sign a peace treaty with Israel settler state. That's very uh, uh, you know, this exposes basically the opportunism uh, of the Egyptian government. Uh, next, ninety fifty nine agreements. I only talked about the 1929 agreement between Egypt and uh, Britain. Now, another one, I, this is known as the 1959 agreement between Egypt and Sudan. It was a sectarian one because uh, what it did, it gave Egypt the right to use 55.5 billion cubic meters of Nile uh, water uh, every year and Sudan 18.5 billion uh, cubic meters per year. And they uh, didn't take into consideration the race of the African countries. And as I said in the beginning, it requires a unified approach. Next. Now, we talk about the water conflict uh, in Africa. People have to realize that uh, just 
Uh, you can yeah, see the map. Over but, another minute, Louise, thank yeah, you. you've got plenty of water uh, in Africa, and uh, there is a loss of water due to evaporation, and uh, this will require some work to be done. Uh, so the water is not evaporated; it can be used for the benefit of our, all uh, Africa. Uh, next, please. And our uh, huge water resource exists under Africa. You see, you just saw the map of Africa, and underneath Africa, you have uh, plenty of uh, underground water. The water table below the surface is huge. Uh, some sp scientists say it has, Africa has under, uh, under, uh, underground water 100 times the amount of water found on the surface. Just it tells you there should not be a water conflict uh, in Africa. Next. I think that's so, our last slide. Yeah, right? yeah basically, I would just uh, conclude by saying that uh, water basically has to be in the hands of the people, but it's going to take a revolution it's going to take a united approach in africa it's going to take the workers coming to power controlling all means of production all resources and really switching water uh for everybody that's what it's going to take Ura. thank you thank you so much louise for that incredible presentation and for so clearly uh pointing out what not only the problem was but the solution about the unified approach um I learned a lot personally from that presentation, so thank you. Okay, we have quite a few uh, questions um, for you. So if our panelists can see anything in the Q&A, feel free to type in answers. Otherwise, we will catalog all of these questions and make sure to send follow-up to all of you who are asking them. So please continue to ask them. Uh, I have the pleasure of turning the floor over to our next speaker, uh, Don Fitz, and before I uh, tell you a little bit about him, although I'm sure many of you know about him, I want to give a special thank you for him and his hard work helping to organize, pulling us all together. It's, it's been a pleasure working with him to get this panel going tonight. Uh, Don is the on the editorial board of the Green Social Thought and was the 2016 candidate of the Missouri Green Party for governor. Uh, he works as outreach coordinator for the Green Party of St. Louis. He is also an author of a book called Cuban Healthcare, The Ongoing Revolution, which was published in 2020. Uh, without further ado, I turn it over to you, Don. Hi, folks. The first thing that I want to say about uh, Rivers is that we really need to uh, um, undo the myth that dams are a uh, solution to climate change. Dams actually contribute to climate change in two huge ways. One is uh, the dams are responsible for a huge amount of carbon dioxide, not in the operation of the dam, but in producing the cement, producing the steel, in the, all, all of the turbines and the things that are used uh, for them, and uh, uh, transportation to the dam site and the dismantling of the dam. The other thing about dams as far as climate change uh, occurs is dams are responsible for a huge amount of methane from the reservoirs, uh, and together these are enormous. Also, uh, Dan, a lot of, this is something which has just come up in the last couple of years, is new research uh, on the poisoning that dams produce from mercury. Uh, there's mercury in the ground, but in the reservoir, the reservoir converts the mercury to methylmercury, which is much more toxic. Methylmercury, uh, it both crosses the placental barrier and it crosses the blood-brain barrier. So when you're talking whether uh, um, prior to birth or whether uh, children and adults, mercury poisoning is one of the worst kinds of poisonings that exist for people. Uh, a, a third point about dams is that they're responsible for the destruction of indigenous cultures across the world. Many indigenous people have religious beliefs about uh, the sacred sites next to water. The dams destroy these sacred sites. Uh, one of the best examples is Brazil's Monte Belo Dam which was built, planned in the 1950s and really got underway uh, the planning in 1975. It was opposed, but, uh, and, it, and the indigenous people stopped the production of the dam, but then the government of Lula da Silva and then later uh, Dilma Rousseff brought the ideas back. 
Uh, and this is a very important point because even progressive governments can be very, very important in, 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 the, in things that are very anti-environmental, in this case, dams. And uh, fourth point is that dams are responsible for the arrest and killing of earth protectors. Uh, the best known example is the 2016 murder of Berta Cáceres uh, in Honduras. She formed a very strong alliance against the indigenous Lenca people and the Gary Funi, who are uh, Afro descendants uh, in Honduras. And for that, uh, for that, she was murdered by the powers in Honduras. The greatest number of people massacred uh, were 440 uh, native people killed in Guatemala, uh, opposing the dam in 1982. A, a fifth point that I want to make is that the, the most, the best known problem with dams is their destruction of ecosystems and, and, and species. Uh, now, what's known most is fish who, who dams stop their migration, but it's also amphibians, insects, microorganisms, birds, uh, uh, reptiles, uh, mammals, lots of species are destroyed as, uh, by the production of dams. And we have no idea of how many species that have never been mapped who river, live in a river bottom in a certain part of the world who then become extinct uh, by a dam. Um, now dams uh, also are very important for driving people from their homes. In Mexico, 4,000 4, dams were built, which caused the removal of 185,000 people. And worldwide, about uh, 80 million people have uh, been forced out of their home by the building of dams. But the number of people who are affected by dams are much more than that 80 million. It's actually the estimated number is 800 million people who lose, lose their uh, uh, ability to produce, uh, lose their ability to support themselves, reduce their ability to have uh, clean water. And it's particularly bad in, uh, in tropical areas because it, uh, dams increase diseases uh, su such as malaria, filariasis, uh, yellow fever, dengue, and schistosomiasis. So there's, dams are very, very destructive. And uh, as Luisi uh, Kinshasa pointed out so well, dams are, can be the source of conflicts between people, especially when the, the people are, are uh, puppets of governments or their strengths are pulled by colonial imperialism. Uh, ju just another example is that Turkish dams have reduced the water flow of Syria by uh, 40%, and to Iraq by 80%. And in the West Bank, 87% of the aquifer water is, uh, is given to the Israelis and only 13% uh, is left to Palestinians. Uh, dams also increase the gap between rich and poor. If you look at the finances of dams, what you find is that investors get the money out of the dams while the whole country, which is predominantly poor people, uh, are, end up paying for the dams. And one of the examples of this is that the typical dam has a 96% cost overrun. So the rich have already gotten their cut and the poor people are pay left paying almost twice as much. And when you look at the way dam financing works, they virtually never take into account the decommissioning of the dam or taking it down and what the cost projections are. So poor people are really hurt enormously. Um, dams break. A lot of times people think of dams as eternal. They're absolutely not eternal. Steel rot, cement deteriorates. Uh, there is a dam, uh, dam breakage occurs all over the world. The worst example I know of is uh, in the Banqiao Dam in Hunan, China. The dam was built in 1950. In 1975, uh, a typhoon happened at the same time of an, an enormous cold front over the Hunan province. And as a result, the, uh, this huge, there, there more rainwater fell in one day than typically falls in a year. The dam collapsed. It could not withstand the, uh, the power of the water surging. The dam broke. The huge tidal wave swept down the river and knocked out 62 additional dams. A total of uh, 26,000 people were died from this series of dam breakage, breakages. And then a plague and diseases spread, in, spread and uh, were, that amount of deaths was six times the original deaths, and so a total of an estimated 171,000 people died from that single dam breakage. Uh, we need to keep in mind that the recklessness of dam, dam building is increasing over time. It's becoming more and more clear that things like solar power and wind power cannot meet the need for the infinite growth of capitalism, which needs to produce more and more stuff, even when it's not needed for people. 
And so as these are, are going, uh, as the solar and wind power are obviously not going to meet the need for capitalist, capitalist uh, exponential growth, they're going to look to nuclear power and dam power, which are two of the most destructive things that can be done. Uh, a point which I think is very important is it's possible to stop this insane dam building. Uh, and it's by a fr old phrase that a lot of old environmentalists have heard, it's called energy conservation. And it's basically reducing the scale of the global economy. And what we need to do is to reduce energy production globally by a massive amount. And there's two parts of this massive reduction of energy we need to happen. One is an enormous reduction of energy for useless commodities at the center of capitalism. Uh, Western Europe, the United States, Australia, Japan need to reduce their uh, energy usage enormously. And at the same time, they need to pay reparations and increase the energy production and help the, uh, uh, and help the countries that have been the victims of imperialism for the last 500 years, predominantly in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. There are ways uh, to, to Basically, there's many things that can be done to get power from the river without producing these huge mega dams. They all have one thing in common. They produce a lot less energy. So we can get some energy out of, uh, out of the water, out of solar power, out of wind power. And it's rational only if we scale back the uh, ridiculous levels of uh, economic expansion under capitalism. Things can be built on rivers like bridge mills, boat mills, uh, water wheels, which are mounted on, on, uh, uh, on boats and get power from the uh, uh, water flowing down. Uh, they do not produce toxic waste. You can place turbines at the bottom of rivers in instead of completely blocking the rivers. And there's something called micro hydro diversion, where you divert some of the river to the side, but it all flows back into the major river. And so you don't uh, destroy uh, species and especially you don't prevent uh, fish migration. So what is it that's causing this crisis? It's basically a crisis of capitalism. Yeah, about one more minute, John, thanks. Okay, great. Okay, uh, capitalism uh, can, can uh, increase profits in three ways. One, it can exploit the internal, uh, internally the working class. And of course, they don't wanna do that because that causes revolution. So instead they turn to cap uh, into imperialism, which leads to eternal wars. But there's a third way that capitalism is expanding production. And what's, that's what I call the, uh, the war on, uh, on the future generations. And the war on future generations calls for the, the use of fossil fuels, the use of hydropower, the use of wind power, the use of solar power, all of them expanding to an infinite, uh, totally irrational use uh, for production, which is uh, negative and has not uh, helped people. What we need to do is to find an alternative ways to produce the things we need uh, so, so that we improve the quality of life for everybody on the planet. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Don. And um, very powerful examples. I know not only the environmental damage, but you shared the displacement that it has on local people. I know one example in Mexico, uh, you mentioned the building of 4,000 dams from 1936 to 2006 involved the removal of over 185,000 people. So the environmental and social consequences are, are quite real. Um, we're gonna turn our attention now uh, to our next speaker, uh, David Hojue, um, who has immense experience working with political campaigns, advising government officials on foreign relations, immigration and financial services. Uh, he works both with the private sector as well as government clients and he's also the co-chair of the Georgia Green Party and supports socialist citizens working together to save Haiti. Uh, David, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. If you can please uh, play the uh, video that you have on file for me, please. L'Afrique de l'Ouest est l'une des zones avec des niveaux de pêche illégale les plus élevés au monde. Cela coûte à la région environ 2,3 milliards de dollars et 300 000 emplois chaque année. Ces pays sont confrontés aux défis du développement et n'ont souvent pas les moyens de surveiller et de contrôler leur espace maritime. 
des millions de personnes à travers l'Afrique de l'Ouest dépendent du poisson comme principale source de protéines. Mais on estime qu'un poisson sur trois capturé dans la région est pêché illégalement. Le Sénégal ne fait pas exception. La pêche y joue un rôle important dans la vie économique et sociale, en contribuant à la création d'emplois, à la sécurité alimentaire, à la création de richesses et à la réduction du déficit commercial. En dépit d'être un secteur critique pour l'économie sénégalaise, la pêche est en crise. La surexploitation des populations de poissons et les activités de pêche illégales sont une réalité. Ces phénomènes menacent la sécurité alimentaire et les moyens de subsistance de milliers, voire de millions de personnes. Selon les organisations de la société civile, le manque de transparence dans le secteur de la pêche contribue à cette situation et facilite cet effondrement. Les données gouvernementales sont difficiles d'accès et complexes à comprendre. Les petits pêcheurs se disent sous-représentés dans les instances de prise de décision dont ils critiquent parfois l'opacité. Ces phénomènes sont d'autant de freins potentiels aux efforts déployés par le Sénégal pour lutter contre la pêche yénène et garantir des pêches durables. L'ONG Environmental Justice Foundation, en partenariat avec le ministère des Pêches et de l'économie maritime, le partenariat régional pour la conservation de la zone côtière et marine et Trigmat Trucking, s'associe dans un nouveau projet pour renforcer la lutte contre la pêche yénène au Sénégal grâce à une meilleure gouvernance et transparence des pêches. Le projet, gracieusement financé par Ocean5, visera à améliorer le partage d'informations, la transparence, à accroître la participation des parties prenantes et à promouvoir des inspections et un contrôle robuste des navires de pêche au port de Dakar. En promouvant activement l'adoption de mesures de transparence essentielles telles que la publication de la liste des navires autorisés et l'inclusion des parties permanentes, nous pouvons fermer la porte aux opérateurs peu scrupuleux et garantir ainsi une pêche véritablement durable pour les générations futures. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, what we just saw in the video applies only to Senegal. But illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, known as IUU fishing, is a global threat. The global demand for fish increases every day. And to meet that demand, thieves, criminal enterprises, are stealing the fish from Africans. While Africans, we have lost their livelihood are dying on high seas trying to reach European shores. Foreign fleets are showing up in African waters and the nations do not have the means to patrol their borders. It's a recipe for disaster. You know, citizens of non-African countries and African countries alike cannot remain inept while the illegal industrial fleeting, uh, fishing fleets are overfishing, stealing food from the pool and destroying biodiversity. Indeed, institutions like Interpol are very much aware of this situation, but most African states still do not have enough resources to monitor and control their vast exclusive ex economic zone. We've seen institutions like uh, Institute for Security Studies that state that without the active support of flag state, it's impossible to address industrial illegal fishing in Africa. To that, I will add, we should also have our people-to-people -people diplomacy. We cannot remain inept. I ask all third parties to make this a central issue on their platforms. 
people's lives are at stake. We have to question the origin of all fish and do not become silent accomplices. We take a fish like totoaba. One kilo of totoaba fish bladder is worth more than one kilo of cocaine on the illegal Asian market. A low risk, high reward alternative fetching up to 50,000 US dollars per bladder. My friend Cisse used to operate three fishing ships. One more minute, ship. David. Thank you. Three fishing ships. But now he is thinking about leaving. And this is not appropriate. We cannot remain uh, silent while we're doing this. I urge everyone to keep this issue in your circle of concern. Fish market must not sell us tainted fish. And we must give this issue the same attention that is given to blood diamond. $23 billion annually is lost while your USAID and USAID uh, uh, provide 8.5 billion of assistance to Africa. So we need, we need the political will is there and we do something similar to the Kimberley process that will unite all the actors on the ground to protect their resources and save lives. I thank you in advance for making this your priority. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great video and, and great presentation. And yes, I encourage anyone that has not examined the situation in what is happening with the Totoaba or the Vaquita in the Sea of Cortez to look into that. Um, those examine some issues that David went over quite well. So thank you um, for your great presentation. We have one more speaker and then we're gonna um, open some things up to our co-sponsors and, and also have our speakers remark on what they may have heard from other panelists, but we uh, have a great speaker next that um, at the Ocean Foundation, we actually get to work with quite closely. So we're, we're pretty excited about uh, our next guest. Um, so please welcome Natalie Lowry. Natalie has been an organizer, communicator, campaigner, and advocate on human rights and global justice issues. For the past decade, she has been the communications coordinator for the Deep Sea Mining Campaign which has opposed deep sea mining industry since 2011. Natalie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you, Jason. Um, so thanks for having me in this space and special thanks to the organizers and the incredible panelists that I'm sharing this space with. Um, so yeah, as Jason has said, uh, my presentation will share insights and the resistance to what could become the biggest extractive development on our planet, and that's deep sea mining. And this invisible land grab is underway, but the good news is that we, there is resistance to it and it's growing. Um, particularly uh, for the last decade, frontline indigenous communities across the Pacific have very much been leading the way to stop deep sea mining before it begins. But before I can begin my presentation, and I will be sharing my screen, um, um, I just want to give you a little bit about myself. So first of all, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the unceded traditional lands of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of Nam, which today is known under the colonial name of Melbourne. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, sea, culture and community that goes back tens of thousands of years, the oldest living cultures on earth. I also acknowledge that wherever I live and walk in so-called Australia, I live and walk on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lands, always was, always will be. Um, and before I talk on the presentation, I wanna make it really clear that I myself am not a Pacific Islander. Um, I grew up in Aotearoa, known as New Zealand. This is a piha um, a, a, on the west coast of the North Island, very dear to me where I grew up. Um, I'm a colonial settler of Irish and Scottish ancestry. Um, I'm Pākehā, which is white, um, and yet my family and extended family crosses the Pacific from Aotearoa to Samoa, Tonga to Papua New Guinea. So when mining um, this form of extractivism, and I've been working around this for nearly 20 years around mining on land, and when it, it started to connect with saltwater, Solwara, the ocean, I felt I had no choice but to understand more what was happening, connect with those on the front lines and build networks of solidarity to stop deep sea miners. So today, as Jason said, I'm presenting as the communication coordinators of the deep sea mining campaign, who for over the past decade have been calling for a ban on this industry. 
So for the past three to four decades, there's been a growing interest in these vast quantities of metal rich minerals in the deep sea. Uh, the interest is far greater now due to the rising demand for minerals and metals to produce high tech applications such as our smartphones and for the so called green technologies such as wind turbines, solar panels and electric storage batteries as we push towards decarbonisation. Currently, there's, there is no operating a deep sea mine in the world. However, there is an intense and growing interest in mineral exploration and exploitation, both in national and international waters. Currently, there's over 1.5 million square kilometers of the Pacific Ocean under exploration leasehold. And to be honest, right now, we have about 18 months to two years to stop this. So it is an incredible, urgent issue to stop deep sea mining before it begins. I mean, as many of you know, the deep sea usually is defined as the realm below 200 metres, um, and it's a world of extremes. The deepest part is the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean that reaches to depths over 11,000 metres. The temperatures in, in the deep seas in many places hover near zero degrees Celsius. There is next to no light and there's great pressures, but life thrives. The deep sea contains a vast array of ecosystems and marine life that we have barely begun to study or understand. Yet speculative miners have focused on three environmental types to exploit for what they are calling potential harvesting for the green transition. And so the first one is um, in the abyssal plains and the deepest of deep oceans, um, deep sea beds. And these contain metallic nodules that form over millions of years as minerals precipitate around fish, teeth, bones, and other small objects. They're sort of the size of like a lump of coal and they're rich in nickel, cobalt, manganese, copper, zinc, and other minerals. Many that are now very much desired for this green transition and the, the green economy. These regions are some of the most remote ecosystems on the planet, but they're home to, to a, lo a lot of marine life, worms, crustaceans, sponges, sea cucumbers, starfish, sea urchins, and various deep sea fish. But we honestly only know, uh, we wouldn't probably even know 5% of what is down there currently. Another type that they're looking to exploit is um, the metal rich crust that covers seamounts. And these rise thousands of meters above these abyssal plains and their coatings are packed with high value metals like cobalt and pl platinum. And the sea mount environments is also thriving with life. It's dominated by corals and sponges and you have tuna, sharks, dolphins, sea turtles and, and much marine life that really depend on these sea mounts. And the final one is the hydrothermal vents, those incredible volcanoes that form in the deep seas. Um, and they are a mineral deposit is, is the, it's, it, they're rich in like copper, lead, zinc, gold, and silver. And these all, all form around the vents of superheated water that occur along volcanic ridges, um, which is known as the Ring of Fire. And one significant area of the Ring of Fire is in the Bismarck and Solomon Seas that run through Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea, which is just north of Australia um, and has been very much at the front line of this fight against deep sea mining. So most of the world's oceans are located outside national jurisdictions. In these areas, deep sea mining is subject to the jurisdiction of the International Seabed Authority. It's a small independent mining agency headquartered in Kingston, Jamaica, exercising administrative control over 50% of the planet's ocean floor. Its membership currently comprises 167 countries as well as the EU. Um, and it's granted 31 exploration license um, permits um, currently to a limited group of countries that sponsor private companies covering areas of the Pacific, Atlantic and Indian Oceans. And so this map here, you can see the different deposits and where they're placed um, around the oceans. I won't um, go into it in this presentation, but the International Seabed Authority is very much driving a colonial narrative um, and it's really up to its neck in corporate capture, but that is a, a whole presentation in itself. Um, and I also want to note, because I'm sure this is uh, predominantly a US audience, the US is not a member as it never signed up to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. However, there is um, a lot of advocacy against deep sea mining happening within the US. So in the short term, it is the polymetal nodules that are of interest to the miners, specifically those in this area called the Clarion-Clipperton zone that you can see here in the Pacific Ocean. 
So the one thing um, the science is telling us is the impacts of mining the deep sea would be extensive, severe and last for generations, causing essentially irreversible species loss and ecosystem degradation. And it risks disturbing the world's <coughs> largest carbon sink. <coughs> Sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> they will use a form of strip mining and it's gonna create these plumes as you see here of sediment with heavy metals that could spread many kilometers beyond the mining areas and throughout the water column in the ocean. Yet this industry has been developing without any proper scrutiny or any social license. And these deep sea miners talk about the deep sea as a far off distance place, you know, um, and this is a way to support the exploitation of um, the seabeds. Was, sorry, this is, I'm someone's at my door. <laughs> Um, as Natalie is, is going to the door, I'll just mention that um, a lot of their work is... So helping... sorry about that. Oh, <laughs> I can continue. My dog's been asleep right until then, of course. Um, welcome to the virtual world. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the deep sea miners, you know, describe the oceans as distant, dark and deep, desolate places. And, uh, you know, they... It, it, it really goes against what these Pacific communities see as their oceans. Um, frontline Indigenous people, local communities and activists and artists and academics all over the world, um, you know, that we've been exposing human rights and environmental abuses around the damaging practices of all forms of extractivism. Of course, dams is definitely one of these. Um, and now, especially peoples of the Pacific, the Pacific, Melanesian, Polynesian, Micronesian, and their large sea of islands, their Pacific ways of being for thousands of years, their traditional knowledge systems, their interconnectedness across the vast Pacific are faced with this new type of exploitation of deep sea mining. And that opposition is huge. And in Papua New Guinea for the Go last- one more decade, minute, Natalie. Thanks. The Alliance for Sawara Warriors have managed to hold off what was the first project to be given um, a green license. Um, there's growing opposition here. I won't go through it, but it's right across the world. Um, and uh, I would like to actually finish with um, a quote from um, Pacific scholar Epeli Haofa, which I think really sums it up. So Oceania connects a sea of islands with the inhabitants. The world of our ancestors was a large sea full of places to explore, to make their homes and to breed generations of seafarers like themselves. People raised in this environment were at home with the sea. They played in it as soon as they could walk steadily. They worked in it, they fought on it. They developed great skills for navigating their waters and the spirit to traverse even the large gaps that separated their islands. We are the sea, we are the ocean. That the past is ahead in front of us is a conception of time that helps us to retain our memories and to be present, aware of its presence. And I leave you with two actions. If you have a phone ready, please scan these QR codes. The top one is um, a Pacific call for a ban and the bottom one is with the Deep Sea Conservation Co Coalition, which is really pressuring um, companies and investors to not invest in this industry. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Natalie. That was a terrific presentation. And thank you for braving the virtual elements. Uh, that, that is our world today. Um, you know, from, from Africa to Australia, we, we definitely had a rich and diverse uh, gambit of, of issues and organizations. While we digest what all of our speakers have said, and before we turn it over to our co-sponsors and speakers, to reflect on these comments, I do want to turn it over to Susan um, to give a sneak peek of what we'll hear in the March presentation. Um, so Susan, I'm going to turn it over to you. We can, oh, we could, we hold saw on, your presentation. I'll share it. Okay, hold on, I'll share my presentation or my sneak preview. Thanks very much, Jason. I hear a common theme with water and fishing and energy and marijuana is exactly that. So March 2nd at seven o'clock, we're gonna talk about the inequities of legalized marijuana. Marijuana grows like a weed. You'd think it would be abundant for everyone. However, the weaponization of marijuana laws have left communities of color incarcerated or 
economically incapable of participating in this billion dollar market of marijuana. So we're gonna have a lot of, we're gonna have four speakers to discuss the barriers to, to the business of, of marijuana. Um, so that's what it's gonna be. I look forward to you guys joining us. Thank you so much, Jason. Great, thank you so much. So now I, I um, wanna turn it back over to the speakers and maybe we can do this in a round robin. So we'll go back and, and we'll just start with Kathleen and then we'll go through the list. If we could keep our comments to two minutes that will keep us on schedule. But I know a lot has been said by some of the other panelists. So I'd like to know from our esteemed speakers, any remarks you have about what your fellow panelists have said or any final closing remarks that maybe you didn't get a chance to say during your presentation. So Kathleen, I'd, I'd like to turn this over to you first uh, and then Louise will go to you next. Um, I just want to thank everyone for being on this call because we see these same patterns over and over again. It is colonialism and it is um, imperialism and it is destruction. And just to remind all of us that in the big picture of things, we were talking about water and water is 70% of you and you can't separate the makeup of the water on the planet from what's in your body and what's in all of our bodies. And I, I really hope that we can stand in solidarity uh, with each other, no matter where we find ourselves physically uh, placed, because this struggle is the same struggle. Thank you, Kath Thank you Kathleen. And that's well said, you know, um, at the Ocean Foundation, we do often like to say, as you said, you know, the ocean is 71% of the Earth's surface and it connects every continent in the world. So we are all connected uh, by water, both physically and um, I, I think philosophically and maybe spiritually as well. So Louise, I'm going to turn it over to you for some final remarks. Yes, uh, what I would like to say is that um, we can uh, struggle, you know, after every issue <clears throat> mentioned uh, in this uh, beautiful uh, conference. Uh, but uh, we can choose to be uh, strategic. We know uh, you can't have capitalism without colonialism. You just can't have capitalism without colonialism. Colonialism is a mode of production as Chairman Amalia has, you know, rightly, uh, scientifically approved. Colonialism as a mode of production is an aggression of nature. That's all, you know, I heard, uh, the, the, you know, the deep mining sea, all that. That's just verify that colonialism is not just aggression of nature that began by aggressing, attacking, assaulting Africa, African people, indigenous people uh, in Americas around the world. So if we want a, a free world where there is no bosses and workers, no colonizers and colonized, no destruction of the seas and nature, we have to support the struggle of the African working class coming to power, uh, and that which means Africa being unified, being united under the leadership of the African working class, this way capitalism will not be able to continue to exist because capitalism cannot exist without or with a revolutionary Africa. Without Africa, there is no capitalism. It's just as simple as that. And that's why I'm calling everyone to join the struggle, to support the struggle for to complete the black revolution, to overturn the verdict of colonizer, of capitalist white power. And this way, the world will be a better place. And uh, that's why basically I'd like to say, uh, end colonialism, then you end all these aggression of nature, aggression for, of the people and everything else. So I appreciate the opportunity to be in this uh, conference. Or, Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your powerful words, and thank you for reminding us that this, we oftentimes think of history as, as settled, but, uh, or something of the past, but thank you for reminding us so poignantly and with such clear examples of how much it affects us today, right now, and could dictate our future. So thank you um, 
for your powerful words. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Don, who I, I can easily say has taught me more about dams tonight than I ever knew in my entire life um, before. So it's pretty great. Don, turn it over to you for some final remarks. Okay, I think that we can summarize everything that every speaker said with two words, and those two words are stop it. <laughs> every one of us is telling the capitalist in one way or another, stop doing whatever it is you're doing. And maybe if we can have the general idea that capitalists do the wrong thing virtually every time they do anything, maybe that, that's not the class which should be doing things. And I wanna emphasize something very important about what I said. When I talked about the need to reduce production, that's not something that needs to be done universally all across the world. When we talk about reducing production, we're talking about reducing things like nuclear weapons. Very few of us eat a nuclear bomb for breakfast or really need them, they don't help us. We're talking about reducing the, the ridiculously expensive luxury items of the rich. We're talking about reducing the production of commodities that are designed to fall apart. That's where all of that stuff comes from that is designed to deteriorate. And I do want to mention some of the, okay, you know, the, the flip side of that is that reducing the global amount of production has to occur simultaneous with increasing the production of necessary items for everyday use by people uh, in the world who have been victims of colonialism. And I, 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 what I want to follow up on is that a lot of what uh, Natalie talked about with deep sea mining, she could validate this better than I, but I think a lot of that stuff is material which is used for alternative energy. Things, uh, things like uh, gold and cobalt and copper, co co cobalt of course is from the Democratic Republic of the Congo predominantly. Uh, and rare earth metals. So a lot of this destruction, that, which is called, which as they say will help the world, is then turned into material for alternative energy, which is very, very destructive. So again, with two words to the capitalist class, stop it. Thank you so much. I, well, you, you summed it up uh, uh, quite well there. Um, Don. Okay, David, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I can, uh, I would like to add that uh, while the uh, big trawlers are stealing the fish, and uh, this, this has a direct impact on women, and this cannot be, uh, uh, it cannot be forgotten. Throughout West Africa, you see the, the artisanal fishing sector it's a crucial source of livelihood and food security. If you take Nigeria, for example, artisanal fishing account for 80% of the fish consumed and the livelihood of about 24 million people. Although men dominate fishing and productions, the women dominate the post-harvest processing, you know, sorting, uh, smoking fish. So when they steal the fish, they leave nothing for the men to fish and they trickle down and also affect the livelihood of every woman. And we remember seeing the women of West Africa called the, uh, the Mama Benz, very entrepreneurial women. And they owe that name to the fact they all had chauffeur driven Mercedes Benz. And uh, so when we have those uh, criminals on the high seas stealing the fish and they'll take it to us to eat, to make us an accomplice, we also have to remember the impact it has on the women. And uh, if all of us had a mom, we cannot sit back and allow this to happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, extremely well said. Natalie, take us home. Sure. Firstly, I want to say thank you for your patience. Um, we can't stop our children and animals <laughs> from interfering in our virtual worlds right now, but it's a reminder that we live with all these beings. Um, yeah, it's a real privilege and honor to be in this space. Um, I especially want to thank Louise for his call and that, you know, this conversation to dismantle colonization, white supremacy is really core at what we need to do. Um, I also want to highlight that this is about waters of our earth and that interconnectedness, which is very much at the center of um, the indigenous communities that I've had the privilege and honor of working with over the years. 
um, that these aren't desolate spaces, they're all interconnected and the rivers relate to the oceans and they relate to the aquifers and they, they relate to all our waterways. Um, and these forms of land grabbing and, and extractivism, whether it's dams, whether it's deep sea mining, whether it's the you know, types of land grabbing happening in Africa, um, this, yeah, I think you're right, Don, you know, we have a right to say no, and this um, has to be stopped. Um, and just to also add to what you said, Don, absolutely the drive for deep sea mining is a drive for this green extractivism, and don't be fooled by it. Um, you know, getting millions of EV cars on the road is not going to solve our problems. We're actually going to be mining more, and we're going to be opening up new spaces the last left remnants of biodiversity, indigenous lands on this planet. Um, and so, you know, we have to unite. The words are solidarity, you know, unification and interconnectedness. And, um, you know, thank you very much uh, for having me in this space. Thank you so much, Natalie. And um, now we're gonna turn things over to our co-sponsors. I'm gonna call on groups in alphabetical order. I would be remiss if I didn't just say how, um, Grateful I am to be on this call and while all of you are in different geographical areas with different experiences, it's uh, I think really refreshing to hear all of you say so many of the same themes and so many of the same consistent calls to action no matter where you are in the world. So that is I think um, refreshing. So I'm gonna turn things over now to our co-sponsors. Um, please keep your comments or questions to two minutes so we have time to get to everyone. And I'm going to call on these groups in alphabetical order. Again, I want to thank all of our speakers for their impactful testimony today and for sharing their important work. I know that I learned a tremendous amount from each of you, so I thank you. Uh, the first uh, co-sponsor I would like to uh, call on is the African People's Socialist Party. Um, uh, Director Aisha Fields. Uhuru, thank you. Um, Uhuru, again, my name is uh, Dr. Aisha Fields, and I am a member of the National Central Committee of the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, and I serve as the director of our development arm, which is called the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project, also known as APDEP. And I, first of all, I want to really salute the organizers of this webinar and all of the presenters. I want to salute my leadership, Chairman Omalia Shatella. And I really want to say that I truly appreciate and unite with the very powerful presentation given by uh, Secretary General of the African Socialist International, Louise Kinshasa. And just to say that our job in APDEP is to organize African scientists, doctors, nurses, educators, agriculturalists, and other skilled Africans to use our skills for the development and the protection of Africa and African people everywhere. We're a revolutionary strategy of the African People's Socialist Party, building dual power development programs in the areas of education, agriculture, healthcare, emergency preparedness, and disaster response. We've taken on the question of uh, lack of access to clean water. Uh, that African people have by building community uh, rainwater harvesting systems in African communities from Houston, Texas to Sierra Leone, West Africa. And while we believe that this work is important, we know that we can't build enough rainwater harvesting systems to solve the water problem that African people face. Fundamentally, the water problem is a political problem. And since African people around the world live currently, not just historically, under colonial domination, all of the major problems we experience are colonial problems. And as S.G. Loezi rightly summed up, the only genuine solution then is to forward the International African Revolution, which is the only process capable of putting the resources of Africa in the hands of the masses of African workers. And that is what will reverse the verdict of colonial capitalism altogether. So I wanna thank you for having the ability to respond on behalf of the African People's Socialist Party. And again, I wanna salute this incredible webinar. Uh, Director Fields, thank you so much for your powerful comments. And again, I thank you for reminding us this is a current problem, not just a historical problem. Um, to our next co-sponsor, I'd like to turn it over to the African People's Solidarity Committee, Penny Hess. Uhuru, and thank you to the Green Party. My name is Penny Hess, Chair of the African People's Solidarity Committee, the organization of white people under the direct leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. I unite with, um, just really also want to salute Dr. Aisha Fields and APDEP, and I unite with the powerful presentation 
by Secretary General Luizzi Kinshasa, and I salute my leadership, Chairman Omali Ishitela and Deputy Chair Onus Ishitela. And I wanna just reiterate what has been said, that all water and land conflicts on the planet are due to colonialism and imperialism. And even to, you know, even to talk about dams, colonialism builds dams, white people built dams, the colonizer built dams, the struggle is to stop colonialism and stand in solidarity with the national liberation of African and indigenous people so that they can control their lives and resources and pay reparations. That's what we have to do. Europe assaulted Africa, stealing human beings and turning them into commodities, stealing African land, water resources and labor that built capitalism and built life for us and maintains it today. And the land and water that makes up the United States was stolen from indigenous people where popular genocide was carried out by white settlers, colonizers, that's us, in a country whose economy is built on the stolen labor of African people. This is called colonialism and Chairman Omali Shatella says that colonialism is the mode of production of capitalism and it's how all the wealth and goods of this system are produced for us. The U.S. wages wars on people all over the world daily and inside the U.S. to control resources, land, water, and the labor of the people. Yes, I believe that we have to have a world where all the resources are shared by all and for the people, not profit. But that will not happen because we wish it to be so. This anti-colonial struggle for power, for national liberation is being led by the African working class and unity with indigenous and oppressed peoples all over the world, all those who make up the pedestal upon which we white people sit. They also invite us as white people to join in solidarity. Check out the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, and the movement for reparations to African people returning the stolen resources, uhurusolidarity.org, unity through reparations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Penny. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, now we are gonna go to uh, our next co-sponsor, Broom Tioga Green Party, Joan McKeeran. Joan, I'll turn it over to you. Joan is not here. Apologies. Uh, we'll go to our next co-sponsor um, from the Deep Sea Defenders, Joshua Clinton. Joshua? Um, yeah, hi everyone. So thanks to all the organizers and all the speakers once again. It's been great listening to everyone. Um, my name is Joshua Clinton. I'm a representative of our organization, Deep Sea Defenders, which was established to fight for a global ban on deep sea mining, building upon the foundations of anti-DSM resistance already laid down by Pacific Island communities, and to disseminate information about the threats which the industry poses not only to ocean life, through habitat destruction and the release of fine particulate matter into the water column, but also to all life on Earth by virtue of the seabed status as our planet's largest and most active carbon sink. Um, our, our, our campaign was set up in the second half of last year by filmmaker Julia Barnes, who's on the call and who recently produced a short film on deep sea mining, which can be found on her YouTube channel. So if you'd like to connect with us with Deep Sea Defenders, just, just reach out. We're active on social media and appreciate any kind of interest in our steadily growing organization. Great, thank you so much, Joshua. Uh, our next speaker is gonna be from the Green Party Albuquerque metro area, Michael Mudd. Michael? Hello, thank you, can you hear me? Um, I just wanted to go over quickly um, an issue that has been grappling, um, well, New Mexico has been grappling with in terms of regional water pollution issues that also um, is, has, is, is a common threat to many around the country and the world, I'm sure. Um, this involves PFAS, um, P-F-A-S, which stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. Um, they're a group of man-made chemicals used in a variety of products, including food packaging, waterproof jackets, um, nonstick pans, 
and also something called aqueous film forming foams, which is used to extinguish fuel based fires. So these chemicals are used in aerospace, automotive, construction, electronics, and very heavily in the military industrial complex, uh, particularly in firefighting training. And so the DOD um, has identified um, many sites um, in, of, um, around bases, um, which have been found um, to, to have caused serious water contamination, groundwater contamination and land contamination. And um, I'm just quickly, um, evidence suggests that most people in the US have PFAS, have been exposed to PFAS and have PFAS in their bloodstreams as well. There's a growing concern about this contamination um, driven mostly by evidence that exposure to PFAS chemicals can lead to adverse health problems such as increased cholesterol, reproductive problems, um, and cancers, particularly kidney and prostate cancers. And now there's been evidence showing that it um, causes a decreased vaccine response in children. Um, the EPA has known for decades about this problem, but has not really established a drinking water standard for any of the PFAS chemicals, but has established a lifetime health advisory level of two major chemicals in this, um, in this family at 70 parts One per more minute, thanks. Um, so according to the EPA, someone who drinks water exceeding 70 parts per million of uh, these PFAS chemicals over a lifetime may have these adverse health effects. Um, so we um, here in New Mexico have uh, this contamination particularly concentrated around the towns of Clovis and Alamogordo uh, where Cannon and Holloman Air Force bases are located. And um, they have seen decades of improper disposal and heavy use of these chemicals. Um, where the groundwater plume contamination has spread, um, particularly um, onto private property where um, dairies are located. We have one dairy that's completely shut down. Um, the, the, the chemical level exceeds the standard in, in most of the cows uh, on that dairy. So businesses have been devastated. But where these cows get their water, the Ogallala, Ogallala Aquifer, which we share with many states, so that now um, there are projects in the infrastructure bill um, that um, have to um, go towards providing a pipeline, taking water from other areas just to serve the municipal areas around Clovis and um, Alamogordo. So the state is attempting to force the EPA to clear this. Thanks. And um, having problems, the defense industry, Def Department of Defense is fighting this. So um, I would urge you to look into your own areas to see what PFAS contamination, there are um, maps available and um, it's a forever chemical. It will, it accumulates, it does not break down. And um, I, I think it's um, probably most, you know, a, a worldwide problem being that it's so heavily used in industry, something that we all need to look out for. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for sharing that very important information. Um, next, we're going to go to the Green Party of Florida, Lizzie Adams. Lizzie? Greetings from the Green Party of Florida, and happy very first World Wetlands Day. <laughs> I'm speaking to you from the Tamuqua Territory here in Florida, mm -hmm. and uh, we um, share our water concerns. and. With, with you, I have a great tool for your toolbox in this fight, and also will be sharing a few web addresses, so you might want to get ready for those. Um, just want to do real quick on wetlands, which are very important to us Lizzie, all. Your 40... camera is not on. Yes, I had to come to you through the phone. 40% uh, of the Earth's plant and animal species depend on wetlands, and one fourth are at threat. They filter water, uh, help with flooding, erosion control, and uh, the biodiversity. They can store 50 times more carbon than rainforests. So I definitely um, recommend you go to rightsofwetlands.org. It's part of what I'm gonna be talking to you about, rights of nature, okay? 
the issues that um, have been discussed with the speaker Luisi about colonization, privatization, degradation, and now even speculation of our natural world is occurring at just such a huge rate. And um, I would like to extend an invite from the International Committee of the Green Party US, the Green Party of Florida, the Green Party of New Jersey, and Australian Greens to join us on Saturday for the Global Greens Virtual Conference, Connecting for Green Action. One more minute. Uh, we have a Rights of Nature and Antarctica Rights session on the fifth Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, the newest Rights of Nature initiative aims to protect the Antarctic and Southern Ocean, a new, newly designated ocean 1 16th of the world's oceans. It's a democratically created declaration for Antarctica rights launching on Earth Day, and everyone can input on that. Rights of nature is based on indigenous worldview uh, as nature, not property. And this Earth jurisprudence is a great tool in the toolbox because we're having regulatory failure and it is just permitting and permitting allowable amounts and non-allowable amounts of pollution to our ecosystems. So we're gonna be sharing uh, a lot of uh, cases that have come up to protect our waters. The recent Los Cedros in Ecuador, the fight in Minnesota for the white earth, uh, Manunin, wild rice, um, and we're seconds. finishing with the Antarctica. So you can go to connectingforgreenaction.org. You don't have to be a Green Party member, connectingforgreenaction.org. And we have Greens from Great. around Thank the world to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. OK, next we're going to go to Green Social Thought, Henry Robertson. Hi. Um, I'm on the editorial board of Green Social Thought, an online journal where our philosophy is we need to produce less stuff, share it equitably, and then we can all enjoy a greener life. So please go to greensocialthought.org and check us out. I want to highlight one more sin of industrial agriculture, and that is in large regions of the United States, especially arid regions like the Great Plains, where the underlain by the Ogallala Aquifer that Michael mentioned, and in California, uh, crops are irrigated by pumping out water from underground reservoir, reservoirs called aquifers. And these are being drained far faster than they can be replenished naturally. And if they go dry, well, then we're in trouble. Now, one thing about climate change is we'll have worse droughts, but we'll also have, we are already also having bigger but downpours. And we need to take advantage of that water and manage it better. I think that there's, uh, in our country, the United States, uh, good room for doing water harvesting. That's collecting the rainwater in tanks and in uh, micro dams, even on in individual farms where water can be uh, captured and then released slowly. This is being done in, by the people in colonized countries like India with monsoon rains, in Zimbabwe, and other countries as well. And that would help us uh, have a more sustainable agriculture. And another thing about- One more minute, well, thanks, Henry. Yeah. Um, we need also to protect our rivers by not cutting down the trees on their banks. You know, logging companies generally, they don't pick one tree here and one tree there, they clear cut. They just cut every tree in an area. And that means that the trees no longer hold the soil. Uh, the soil washes off into the streams, which is bad for the rivers, bad for the life in the rivers and bad for the land. So we need to protect our forests if we're going to protect our rivers. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate that, Henry. Okay, we're gonna go to the Missouri Green Party, Susan Armstrong. Susan. Thank you, Jason. I'd like to talk about, to bring into your level, your circle of concern, lead and drinking water. Here in Missouri and across the nation, there's lead in drinking water. We've talked about pesticides and herbicides. We've talked about the bio load, but in our taps, what our children are drinking, 
is lead, dangerous levels of lead. Um, medical people say that there's no safe levels of lead. However, we have rates that exceed one parts per billion. Now in Missouri, um, particularly in St. Louis, let's go small. In St. Louis, lead poisoning is significant with African-American uh, students. Also, so look, going out in Missouri, we have a current proposed legislation that is gonna filter lead, I'm sorry, filter drinking water into schools. It's proposed that in 2023, there will be filtered drinking water in schools. And right now it's also a big uh, priority of the EPA to reduce lead in drinking waters. In 10 years, it's discussed taking out the lead service lines. Uh, something about colonialism, I, I imagine there's gonna be a day when we recalibrate our colonial values and think we were poisoning our children with their very own drinking water. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your comments again, um, Susan. Okay, we're gonna go to Project Animal Freedom. Kyle, Kyle, you're up. And Kyle, can you pronounce your last name for us? Luzinski. Okay, good. I didn't wanna mess it up, but I wanted everyone to hear it. So thank you. I wanna thank you sincerely for not only hosting this event, but inviting us to participate and giving us the opportunity to speak. I would like to discuss the role of animal agriculture and water depletion, water pollution, and water security. Um, now, not only does animal agriculture occupy 45% of the Earth's ice-free land, but it accounts for a disproportionate amount of freshwater usage. In fact, one study found that animal agriculture uh, consumes 56% of all fresh water in the state of California. There are also a host of other issues with factory farm runoff poisoning rivers. Uh, one, uh, one quarter of all the river miles surveyed by the US Geological Survey have been deemed dangerous to swim in due to factory farm runoff. Um, another issue with Water depletion is the fact that the vast majority of water being pumped out of the Ogallala Aquifer is actually being directed to feed crops for animals. And the vast majority of farmland, in fact, or arable land more generally, is dedicated to animal agriculture. In fact, there was a recent study that I saw earlier today that indicated that uh, we could reduce the amount of farmland we use uh, by about three quarters if we adhered to a fully plant-based diet. Uh, something else to keep in mind when it comes to animal agriculture is that it's using vast quantities of water that other misuses of water pale in comparison to. For example, fracking in this country consumes anywhere from 70 oh, to 140 man, billion gallons of water each year, but a recent Penn State study revealed that animal agriculture consumes anywhere from 36 trillion to 74 trillion gallons of water in the US each year alone. That is for every gallon of water that is wasted by fracking, 250 gallons on the low end and up to a thousand gallons on the high end are wasted on animal agriculture. What I'm trying to suggest is that there is no way to achieve water security without addressing the cow in the room. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. And you know, I'm sitting here in Washington, DC, and obviously in our backyard is the Chesapeake Bay, which has suffered tremendously from agricultural runoff and pollution. And so um Appreciate your hard work on this issue. Um, next, we're gonna go to um, David Finkel from Solidarity. David. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm, just, uh, I'm just on the phone, not on camera. Um, on behalf of uh, Solidarity and the uh, magazine Against the Current that we publish, um, I hope everybody is safe tonight in the pandemic and the snowstorms that are sweeping across uh, much of the country. Uh, I'm speaking from Michigan, 
where, among other things, just to mention a few things, uh, climate change is uh, messing up the growing seasons and threatening the existence um, in northern Michigan of uh, the fruit crops, uh, cherries and blueberries, which are a huge part of the um, agricultural uh, uh, agricultural base of uh, northern Michigan. Also a state where um, Enbridge Line 5 uh, underwater threatens the uh, threatens the uh, ecosystem of the entire Great Lakes should it rupture. Uh, also a state where Nestle is extracting huge, huge amounts of water um, by the minute uh, for their uh, bottled water industry and they pay virtually nothing for it. And I could also mention that um, as uh, the PFAS problem was mentioned before, we have enormous uh, PFAS problems here you know, here in Michigan. Um, tonight's program is, I think, a uh, very important example of something that some of us on the traditional, what's called the traditional left, so to speak, um, have been late in wrapping our heads around, and that is the sort of intersection, the nexus of water, agriculture, climate change, and the uh, uh, the disaster taking place in the ocean. Uh, are, it's really a nexus that threatens the survival of civilization and the survival of our species and of a whole lot of other species that we would be taking down with us. Uh, so this kind of consciousness needs to be expanding. I think that tonight's program uh, has made a big contribution to it. We need more like it. And uh, again, we're, we're, we're glad to be here. And uh, we hope that this discussion opens up even more widely. Thank you. Thank you, David. I really appreciate that. Next, we're going to go to Jesse Neville from um... Euro Solidarity Movement. And if I pronounce that incorrectly, please uh, pronounce the, it correctly. And I apologize if I didn't say it correctly. Thank you, Jason. It's the Uhuru Solidarity Movement. And Uhuru means freedom in Swahili. And Thank I, you. no problem. Thank you. I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. The Uhuru Solidarity Movement is the mass organization of the African People's Solidarity Committee, whose chair, uh, Penny Hess, spoke earlier. And we work under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party and Chairman Omalia Shatella, organizing in white communities to build solidarity with the anti-colonial struggle of African and oppressed peoples. The Uhuru Solidarity Movement exists in 130 cities throughout the United States and has our headquarters here in St. Louis at 2654 Gravoy Ave. And I want to join in saluting the members and leaders of the African People's Socialist Party who spoke in this meeting tonight, including Secretary General Louise Kinshasa for his brilliant statement and express my full unity with it, as well as Director Aisha Fields and Penny Hess, the chair of APSC, and appreciate the Green Party for hosting this important discussion. And based on the leadership of Chairman Omali Shatella, we in USM recognize the urgent social contradictions associated with the environment, land, agriculture, water, resource depletion, and climate crisis can never be separated from the struggle of African and colonized peoples for liberation from colonial domination. We know there are many among us, colonizers, settlers, white people, including here in this meeting, who are concerned about the future of life on this planet, who want to do something to change our relationship to the rest of humanity and take responsibility for what we have done to them and to the world. And what the party, what the African People's Socialist Party is saying is that what we have to do if we really wanna make a difference is join in the struggle of African people to overturn colonial capitalism. And that means uniting with the revolutionary demand for reparations to African people. That is the essential question. And as the ones who have benefited from this system, we can't lead the struggle, but we do have a responsibility as white people and an interest in standing in solidarity and working under their leadership and fighting for reparations to African people. So in this spirit, I want to extend a warm invitation to the Green Party 
and to every organization and individual here today to participate in our upcoming national convention entitled Unity Through Reparations, Reparations Through Organization, which will be held on March 18th through the 20th. It will kick off with a live in-person rally for reparations at the base One of the minute, infamous, at the base of the infamous Gateway Arch, the notorious symbol of so-called manifest destiny, aka colonial genocide, a monument built in typical colonial fashion on the bulldozing and destruction of an African community. You can register for the rally for reparations Friday, March 18th at 12 p.m. by going to reparationsrally.eventbrite.com or you can contact me at info at uhurusolidarity.org to endorse, get involved, and help build this action where we will have a long line of people from one end of the arch to the other holding bold banners calling for reparations to African people and followed by a weekend conference uh, featuring Chairman Omalia Shatella and other African People's Socialist Party leaders, as well as Chairwoman Penny Hess, we will dive deep into what we can do as white people to go beyond protest, charity, sentiment, and well-wishing and take a truly meaningful principled stand of solidarity through reparations to African people under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party. So you are all invited. We will be sending the Green Party and others here a formal invitation to participate with solidarity statements and everyone is welcome to attend and you can register for that at uhurusolidarity.org slash register. Thank you so much, Uhuru. Great, thank you so much, Jesse. I really appreciate that. Okay, Universal African People's Organization, Zaki Baruti. Uh, Zaki, you're up. First of all, let me uh, just say good evening, uh, Uhura. Power to the people, assalamu alaikum. Um, let me salute, first of all, the kind of information that has been uh, shared this evening has been very powerful, very inspiring. But also at the same time, I would like to just share a very brief statement from the Black is Back, uh, 19 points of Black self-determination of which our organization is a member organization around the whole issue of climate. And uh, it's climate change and toxic pollution created by capitalism must end. We demand that the capitalist countries take responsibility for the destruction of the environment through policies based on the parasitic profit motive. We recognize that capitalists induce climate change for our brothers and sisters on the continent of Africa is a matter of life and death due to the resulting drought, death, famine, and starvation. We recognize that capitalist pollution and toxic waste dumps in Africa, as well as in our communities throughout the United States endangers the health of African people everywhere. We recognize that the same system that beat itself, that built itself through colonial occupation, genocide and enslavement has no regard for the safety of the planet and the health of our communities. And uh, <clears throat> as each of the panelists shared, we have a serious uh, problem in terms of the capitalists. I would like to just say the murderers, and the thieves, because that's what we're talking about, people dying from their policies, that they are actually needed to be arrested, imprisoned, and uh, at times executed for their wicked deeds upon the people. So I also, on part of the Universal African People's Organization, stand in complete solidarity with the statement by our good brother, uh, Louise that in order to solve much of the problems that's facing our people it has to be an end to colonial capitalism. And it is my hope as I enter about the, my 75th birthday shortly, <laughs> that I can see in my lifetime where we have a United States of Socialist Africa. And in fact, we have a United States of Socialist America for the sake of humanity. That's what this is all about. And too many people are, are dying from the policies of uh, what I like to just say, wicked people. And again, I just say we have to, if we're talking about, as we analyze the, I mean, the problems, what is the real solution? And the real solution has to be a socialist uh, reality. 
So on that note, I just again want to compliment you. the organizers for tonight and say that we have a serious task ahead of us. And that's seizing power for a better day for humanity. And as we seize power, we implement socialism. On that note, uh, may God bless each and every one of you. Well, thank you so much uh, for those wonderful comments. We have 13 minutes left uh, in, in tonight's meeting. And I wanna leave a little bit of time uh, for Don to, to close us out with any final remarks. Right now, I wanna go back to our panelists. We just heard from all of our um, co-sponsors. First of all, let me thank all of the co-sponsors for supporting this event and supporting this dialogue and fostering a place where we can have this communication. I wanna turn back to the speakers to respond to anything that they may have heard. Uh, Louise, I, I think I would be remiss if I didn't turn to you first. Obviously, um, some people have, have acknowledged your comments here tonight. So let me just turn the floor back over to you and, and have you respond to anything you've heard here tonight. Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, thank uh, the Gateway Green Alliance for inviting me. And I want to unite and thank those who are united with the presentation we made. Uh, we are living through incredible time in history. And uh, you can see everywhere that the uh, United States imperialism oh, is in crisis. Uh, France is in crisis. Uh, the Malian ambassador, uh, the, Mali, the, the Mali uh, president just uh, expelled the French uh, ambassador. And uh, Africans are demanding everywhere uh, the end of French imperialism. But we, the African People's Party, we say we're demanding the end of the entire colonial system. It needs to go. And uh, we, uh, under the leadership of, of uh, Chairman Amadi Sheda, we are driving forward the struggle to overturn the verdict of imperialist white power. It has to go. And uh, we're organizing a plenary. And I invite anybody who is in this platform and anybody who is watching you cannot miss this plenary. Just go to APSPplenary.org and register. This is the historical plenary that is going to drive forward the struggle for national liberation for African people. As I said, capitalism cannot survive without colonialism because we, we, we talked about the problems caused by capitalism. But what creates capitalism? That's the question we need to answer. Colonialism brought capitalism to life. So if you destroy colonialism, you destroy capitalism and all the problems we heard that capitalism is doing to African people, to colonize people, and to the world, to the planet. So everybody has opportunity to unite with the, uh, the uh, program put forward uh, by uh, Chairman of Mali and the African Socialist Party. And I just want to thank you, everyone. And as I said, this is an incredible time to be alive and to fight for a better world. Support the, f the effort to build the African Socialist International uh, and come to the plenary uh, is basically next week. You can't miss it. So thank you, uh, the chair, Jason. Thank you, the organizer. Uh, thank you, Don, and uh, every all the panelists. I uh, really thank you for your, for your participation. And I look forward to more discussion like this. And I also look forward to see you at the plenary next week. Go to APSPplenary.org. You can't miss it. Thank you so much. World. Great, thank you so much. And it looks like we, um, Jesse and uh, Dr. Field, or Director Fields has put the website in the chat box. So for anyone that wants to register that is in the chat box, please see that. Um, to any of our other panelists, uh, David, Kathleen, Natalie, Don, uh, anything that you would all like to, to say? Um. Uh, I will, but maybe because I'm, you know, I'm in a region that's often forgotten, and that's the Pacific, yet it's a massive region. Um, everyone talks about the Pacific as small island nations, but really they're large ocean states. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, it, it has to be recognised that when so-called slavery was abolished, even though we know we have modern day slavery now, um, slavery still existed in um, this region. And in fact, in Australia, the the blackbirding, which was a form of slavery, was taking people off Pacific islands to come and work in the 
plantations here um, and that's what grew the the white Australia um, economy so you know this is also interconnected the other thing I kind of want to add in my work and I I am a colonial settler so I recognize that and I recognize my privilege um, but in all my years that I've been um, an activist uh, in indi indigenous knowledge systems their science their own research are really going to be part of our solutions to live on this planet. And um, that's something that's really dear to my heart to, to continue to push out. And I know that um, someone in the chat has talked about rights of nature. And, you know, we, we talk about that within um, Papua New Guinea, and they don't talk about rights of nature, but they talk about their rivers as living beings and how interconnected they are. These sort of interconnections with each other um, and the living planet is is really very important and the kind of political structures um, and it's great that you know there's there's some fantastic socialists on this call um, and that there's these spaces that these conversations are happening are really really important so our yeah, solidarity to everybody um, don't forget how important the Pacific region is in this conversation um, and we have a big struggle here that intersects with militarization particularly with the China um, Australia US sort of allegiance of posturing against China um, and, and deep sea mining is very intersected in that. So uh, yeah, we are all very deeply interconnected across this planet and, and water, our oceans and our rivers um, are a very big part of that for us. So thank you. Great. Um, Don, I'm gonna give you the final word actually to close us out. So let me just ask really quickly if uh, uh, David, um, or Kathleen has any other comments they want to say really quickly. I was just looking at the, uh, I was just looking at the questions and I wanted to see if there's any that we needed to get to, but there, there seems to be a real understanding of the commodification of people and resources and the colonialism that undermines the capitalist model that, that, that got this mess to where it is. And I want to acknowledge the folks and the, and the questions that were represented. Great, thanks. Uh, David, anything you wanted to say? Okay, um, thank you everyone for joining our call tonight. Don, I wanna give you the kind of uh, closing remarks to close us out. I wanna thank all of our um, panelists for their great presentation, all of our co-sponsors for supporting this event. Don, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Okay, thank, thanks a lot. This. Uh, th this has really been, you've done a wonderful job of moderating uh, this program. I really appreciate that. Uh, I want to uh, go back to what uh, Michael Mudd of the Green Party of Albuquerque metro area said about militarism, because I think it's, it's very, very important. As she pointed out, militarism totally destroys water systems. And military production is a very unique aspect uh, of capitalist production, because it's the only area of production that adds, adds absolutely nothing to use values. It does nothing to produce anything which is more of what people get, it, get to live. It's entirely destructive. And she pointed out basically by bringing, she brought up the other aspect of, of military production. It's, just, it's a negative value on the total wealth of a society, because in one way it destroys the people in the society, it lives by poisoning the water and poisoning the land around it. And it's negative in the sense that it, the only thing it does is to aim to, to destroy things that other people have. So, um, and this ties in directly to what I'm saying that of what I said before, that a lot of people have difficulty with, especially socialists have, a lot of socialists have difficulty with, is that if we produce less, we can have a better quality of life. In other words, everybody's quality of life would go up to the extent that military production goes down. Um, I think that's impor very important because if any of you have ever heard of a person named Karl Marx, one of the things that made a distinction between is use values and exchange values. And militarism produces absolutely no use values. There's nothing of use for it. And so uh, the, the last words that I would like to this webinar, you know, I, I would just again like to reiterate that what all of us agree on 
is that when we're talking to our local capitalists and to capitalists, the simplest slogan should be, stop it. Thanks, everybody. For tuning in tonight. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful night.